So the title of this session is looking at UK CCS research, so really kind of looking at some of the projects that have been funded through the UK CCSRC. My name's Claire Goff, I work for the Tyndall Centre at the University of Manchester. Um, my background is in social science, I've done stakeholder and public perceptions of CCS and BECS and I've done some work through the CCS for many years, um, currently looking at social licence to operate. So this session is slightly out of my comfort zone, so I'm hoping for lots of questions for the audience to, to support me in that. So the first speaker that we have um, is joining us online, um, hopefully that's all ready to go. Um, so that's my Professor Michael Holinsky from the University of Birmingham, um, and he's going to be talking about one of the flexible funding projects that uh, the UK CCS has supported. Great. Hi, so hi everyone, sorry that I couldn't join you today, I'm, I'm having a bit of trouble travelling at the moment, um, but it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you about our project and uh, some of our work. So I think I can click, yeah, great. So um, I'm coming from the University of Birmingham and we're all about quantum sensing. So I'm going to start off telling you a little bit about what that, what that is and what we do. So quantum technology is, is quite a new wave of emerging technologies that are coming out. And the UK has really put a focus on trying to show some leadership in bringing that from laboratory to the field. So we, we have a history now, roughly 25 years ago, these techniques have been demonstrated in laboratories and we're now really focused on can we bring them into practical applications. Quantum technology is anything that's based on what we would call a quantum effect. So one example of that is quantum entanglements. Now this would be a GIF, but it's, I've decided not to use the GIF because I didn't want to give anyone uh, any, any um, flashing lights or so. But if we had two atoms, for example, these blue and orange circles here, and um, they were in some quantum state, we wouldn't know or we, de determining what state one of them in it is in would fully tell us what the other one is, regardless of how far apart they are. So acting on one atom somewhere can tell us what the other is doing somewhere else if those two states are entangled. And this is one of the ways people are trying to make um, new techniques in quantum communication. And another quantum effect is called quantum superposition. I'm going to tell you a bit more about that in, in a little while. And that is where we, we normally think of something as being in one place or one position or having one amount of energy. But actually, in quantum mechanics, it's possible for something to simultaneously exist in both two places at the same time and not know which place it's in. So in the bottom right hand side, you can see a picture here where we could imagine having an atom either occupying some position in space on the left or the right. But in quantum mechanics, it can actually be both on the left and the right at the same time. And that's fundamental to how our instruments work. And Techniques that exploit this have led to a, um, a kickoff of a program in the UK. So going back to 2014, the UK government initiated um, the program by creating four quantum hubs. That um, was an injection of funding of about 270 million into the UK, UK ecosystem. And that's grown now, bringing in industry and bringing in more investment from the government to around a billion pounds in size. So we have a really substantial program in the UK. And if there's any interest in like hearing more about that or connecting to the different parts of that, then let me know. I'm very happy to connect people and my email address is at the end. So there's, there's four hubs. Those are looking at new techniques in imaging. So for example, they're looking at new ways of looking through smoke or looking, looking at some um, detecting different gases. We have um, work on communications. So ways of having ultra secure communications, for example, quantum computing, which is a way of actually paralyzing computing in a new way and look, offers some new ways to solve complicated problems and quantum sensing. And our hub at Birmingham is really focused on that. So we're trying to build the next generation sensors for gravity. So being able to detect things by, by their mass distribution, gravity gradients, which is a different way of doing that. And I'm going to tell you more about. And also things like new accelerometers, new rotation sensors, new magnetometers and clocks. And to give you an idea, we're normally talking about things that are on the low technology redness scale, but have the possibility of extremely high performance. So for example, the kind of clocks we're building, they fill roughly a car boot in terms of size, typically a bit bigger, but they start to be sensitive enough that they could measure the age of the universe to within a second. So they, they can, if you want really the top end of performance, quantum typically has something to offer. If you want something very small and compact, quantum is usually a bit further away, but it does depend on the specific technologies that we're talking about here. So gravity sensing, that's where, where I'm coming from. The interest there is it's a very weak force, but it exists between any two masses. 
So regardless of how far apart I put two masses, whether it's a star across the universe or some stone under the ground, it's creating some gravitational pull. And that force is in principle something one detect can detect as long as you can make a sensor that's sensitive enough or accurate enough to do that. And in a practical sense, what that's useful for is actually measuring information about the density in the environments around us. So if we make a, me a map, let's say we take a gravity sensor and we move it along some line, that gives us information about the gravitational pull at that point, and we can conjecture from that what the mass distribution or density distribution was under the ground. And for example, we can use that to look at things like, is there water under the ground moving around, or are we looking at voids under the ground and the formation of voids? Those are some of the things we're interested in. And now gravity sensing is already used in a lot of applications, and uh, it's very useful for things where you want long-term time-lapse measurements. So if you want to sit in one position and monitor, see if the, the gravity in the environment is changing, that's a useful application of gravity. So trying to detect water changes, or if there's some degradation in the local soil, for example. And it's also useful in space, spatial mapping. So trying to detect things like fault lines or trying to detect um, underground infrastructure can be done with gravity. But the challenge is that current sensors are typically limited by vibration in particular. So if the ground's vibrating, that looks for, for the gravity sensor, that looks identical to a change in the local mass distribution. So it's a noise for the gravity sensor. And what that means in practice is that they have to measure for a very long time in order to reach a useful le level of noise where they could actually say something about density uh, in, in the environment. And that means gravity surveys are much more expensive or slow than we'd like them to be. And on the other side, when we're looking at more of the absolute sensors, mechanical wear can limit how often you measure or limit the accuracy of measurements. And that, that's something that we hope to be able to address with quantum. So quantum, what we do is actually in our hub, we use atoms as a sensing element. So what you see in the picture here, so if we look on the left-hand side, we have this red glowing thing in the side. That's about 10 to the nine atoms that have been cooled down with lasers so that they're moving slower than a snail. They're very, very slow. And we cool them down so that they're slow so that we can probe them for a long time and have a very good sensitivity. And in practice, these are some of the coldest things that you can actually see with your eyes. So we're talking about micro kelvins of temperature here, maybe even hundreds of nano kelvins, depending on the temperature, depending on the experiment that you're talking about. And so what we do in our experiment is we generate one of these cold clouds of atoms and we drop it and we look at what happens when it falls and use that to say, has gravity changed? Has the magnetic field changed? Or we can store it in a trap for a long time and watch what it's doing to make a measurement of whether the frequency of the, the laser light is changing, for example, to make a clock. So that, that's our core sensing element. And what's really interesting about that is that these atoms are absolutely indistinguishable. So if I take one atom of a certain isotope of a certain element, and I wait, use it up, and use another one a year later, that atom looks exactly the same as the one that I used the first time. So we can escape quite easily from things like mechanical wear and tear, and it gives us a way of, in principle, achieving very good, very low drift. The challenge is just making the rest of the instrument work around the atoms. The atoms are really ideal, but quantum technology still has a way to go in terms of making the stuff small, compact, and um, robust in the field. So how do we sense gravity? This is where the quantum technology part comes in. So here, what you see on the picture, on the left-hand side, we have one atom. So just imagine we have one atom and I've dropped it. So it's falling. We started with that little cloud, but now it's falling. I shine a laser pulse on it and I tune the parameters to that pulse so that it has a 50% chance of the atom getting some momentum kick from the pulse. So I change the intensity of the light, change how long I apply the pulse for, tune the frequency of the light. I can tune exactly the probability uh, that, that it has of absorbing some light. And if we tune it to have a 50% chance, then what actually happens is before the pulse, the atom is in one state. And after the pulse, it's in a state where it both has and hasn't absorbed some light. And that means that it's in a quantum superposition. And what we have then is some has absorbed some momentum and it would follow, for example, the top line, some hasn't and it would follow the bottom line. We wait some time when we can shine another pulse on that inverts the momentum distribution, causing them to move to, towards each other again. And we shine a final pulse on that re reconstitutes the cloud and interferes it with, its, with itself. So we, we can build an interferometer from single atoms here. Another way of thinking about what's happening is in quantum mechanics, any particle can either be behaving as a particle or a wave. And those light pulses are splitting atom waves and recombining them 
so that we have something that's identical to an optical interferometer in the end. And by looking at the output of that interferometer, if we see a change in the phase between the two outputs, then we can see a change in gravity. So if I had something underneath this picture here, let's say some water going up and down, that would pull the two paths differently and give me that gravitational change. Now, the amazing thing about this is we're effectively using the laser as a ruler to measure how those ideal atoms fall. And that could give us a very good way of removing drift. So a promise of having very good absolute sensors in the future. But another thing that we can do is we can take two of those systems and put them on top of each other and now take the difference of those measurements. And what that does is it removes any vibration because the vibration would be the same for both because it's coming through the same laser beam. And that means vibration's gone, we can measure much faster than we could have otherwise. What it also means is because those two interferometers will be at different heights, they're measuring different parts of the gravitational potential, different gravity signals, and taking the difference means we measure the gravity gradient. So we keep the, some gravity information, but we lose the vibration. And that allows us to make faster measurements and increase the spatial resolution of our, our um, maps, for example. The, the one caveat though, is it means if I have a far away mass or a deep mass, then actually that looks very similar for the two, the two interferometers. So we have a stronger fall off with distance and a weaker sensitivity to distant targets. So that's like a bit of how the same things work. And this is where we are. So this is our gravity gradiometer that we've built at Birmingham. I, I can't see the bottom of the slide, sorry, but there might be a reference there if you want to read more about it. We've um, managed to achieve a performance of about 20 Bosch on, on the noise of that sensor. That unit may mean something to some of you, it may mean nothing. I'll give you some, comment, some uh, reference points in a moment. But essentially that means we can take the thing out into the field and in about 10 minutes, we can acquire a useful level of noise that starts to be relevant to detecting features under the ground. And so what we did is we performed a survey over a tunnel. And this is the first time someone has taken a quantum sensor and, and tried to find something under the ground. And here we managed to see a two by two meter tunnel that's a few meters deep under the ground with a signal to noise of about eight. So we've kind of proven that these sensors can be useful for something now. And this, this is relevant to, to kind of near surface infrastructure, for example. And so what we want to think about is how relevant is quantum technology for CCS applications? So we get a lot of people telling us all the time, quantum, you should do this, you should do that. And a lot of people were shouting to us, you should really be thinking about CCS because it's an obvious application for gravity. And what we wanted to do is just look into that a bit more and start to connect to the CCS community and understand, is that true? What are the real opportunities for quantum to help in CCS? And can we quantify those a bit and start to understand the roadmap for how quantum can become something useful or not for the CCS community? So a large part of the project for us was starting to have that discussion and if there's interest or if, if you know, you, you see things that can help us like form a view on that or interested in helping form a view on that, then please do talk to us because we're very interested in hearing, are we thinking about the right things, wrong things? Are there things we're missing? Are there big problems you think we could help with or not? So it's very interesting to know. But what we decided to do was focus on near surface gas in, gaseous injection as a first step because there what we can do is we can make models and validate them. And we have good, we, we had some good connections where we could get good knowledge of those sites and have a good interpretation of what, what we expect to see. So what we did is we made models of the geoenergy test bed working with the BGS and looked in the literature to see what have people done in gravity surveys um, with, with CCS previously. And what we wanted to do is consider how could gravity or gravity gradiometry work from the surface now, rather than in boreholes where we've done some other work uh, previously. And we think that's interesting, but that's quite a challenging roadmap for us. So we're looking at the surface to understand is there an opportunity there or not. And as I say, we want to use those outputs to really inform our roadmap. And if, if anyone's interested in having a look at our report, then just let me know and I'm happy to share that. Oh, so next slide. So this is an example of one of the models that we've built. So here what we have is um, an injection point 15 meters under the ground. So this is really shallow stuff compared to most CCS real deep storage applications. And um, we're looking at now a plume that's displacing water and we've built gravity and gravity gradient models to understand the kind of signals that we could expect from those features. And then we've done some work extrapolating that down to think, okay, what would that look like in a deep CCS storage application? So here, for example, this is a shallow injection. We're going down to about 15 meters and we've made estimates about the plume size and shape that we expect to see. And from that, we estimate that for gravity, we would see signals of about 15 microgal or for gravity gradients, about 40 at Bosch. And that means these features, these near surface features could be relevant to current quantum technology 
the signal to noise wouldn't be excellent, it'd be, it'd be quite weak, but actually the future generations of quantum technology could be very relevant to these types of applications or, or understanding test sites. So see, these are some of the conclusions of the project. So we think quantum technology, gravity and gradiometry are both interesting for near surface shallow injections, but also we see that there might be some interest in having a better understanding of near surface processes in how they affect other monitoring techniques for looking at the deep surface. So for example, with a quantum gravity gradiometer, we could tell you more about the, the groundwater at the top. We might have another input for that that helps give more information and that might help reduce some ambiguities for like looking into deeper stuff. Quantum technology gravity sensing could be useful as a complementary tool for deep storage. It's not going to displace things like 4D seismic, but it could be a useful piece of information to add to the remote sensing toolkit. So we think that could be an interesting, an interesting way to push things. And we think the main benefit that you could expect over current technology is that the long-term stability could improve. Gravity gradiometry, because of this differencing, it's not likely to be useful for deep storage. It may give you some information about the top surface, but it's not likely from the surface to be useful for deep storage. However, we do think in boreholes, it could provide a lot of extra information. So if you could move a quantum gravity sensor up and down near a storage site, then that, that could be of interest. So I'll say a little bit more about that now. So you've seen our previous sensor is quite large. It's like the size of a washing machine and a tall tower. Now we're working on much more compact sensors in the hub. So these are person portable devices. We think these can reach the same kind of performance in the next few years. So here we're getting down to something like 100 liters. Still too large to go into a borehole, but it starts to get more useful if you want to do like an airborne survey or something. And we now have a small company that started up to try and build those sensors and start exploiting them to so start pushing them towards applications. And finally, we've now done some tests where we've done the first measurements of quantum um, technology devices going into boreholes. Here, it's not a full sensor yet. It's just a, a trap. So we're looking at how does the cloud perform? Can we generate and maintain the cloud when we go underground? Do we have any challenges with that? And here, that's all worked very beautifully. But the challenge is now, how do we scale that up to a sensor? How do we scale the, um, the outer diameter to reach and then exceed what's currently being used? Uh, in industry. So currently our cold atom part is already the same um, diameter as an industry sensor, but if we want the whole package to shrink down, it would need to shrink down by roughly a factor of two. So we're now like understanding is that a good direction to push, is that a good investment to make or not? And I think that's nearly me. So this is the team. So this is Jamie, who's the lead of the project. And then we have um, Kevin and Jeff from Birmingham as well. And they've really pushed on the modeling side. And we've been working strongly with the BGS, Paul and, and uh, Kerry there, who really understand the geoenergy test side. And of course, bring a lot of information and knowledge on the, um, on the CCS side and have been helping us do the models and understand, are we modeling the right kind of things? And that's uh, me. So thank you very much. And um, I'm very happy to answer any questions if I've not talked for too long already. clear explanation of what's clearly quite a, a, a very complicated subject. So we've got a couple of questions online. Um, I'll take one online and then go out to the room and then come back to the online question just to, to welcome our um, online participants. So a question from Ben Stewart. Is there parallel work being done on the utility of laser cooling in harsh environment quantum sensing? Um, so I'm not sure exactly how to take the question, sorry, but th there's definitely parallel work going on ac across the globe here. So we're really leading on bringing gravity radio radiometers out into the field, but there's some very interesting work going on in other places as well. So a demonstration that might be particularly interesting for this community is that um, recently we had a publication coming from the French community where they had taken a quantum gravimeter, installed it at the top of a volcano and used that to monitor magma flows under the ground, working in synergy with two superconducting gravimeters. So that actually has given them some like, indication of how the magma is moving under the ground. And of course, these are deep targets uh, that are quite interesting. Then similarly, we start to see quantum technology companies building and starting to try and exploit sensors in most countries now. So there's a real acceleration of the uptake. I hope that's um, helping with the question, sorry. Great, thank you. Um, so are there any questions from, from the floor? Muir, um, so the microphone, if you could introduce yourselves when you ask your question, please. Hi, uh, I'm Muir Freer, University of Manchester. It's fascinating research you're doing. I was just wondering what sort of spatial resolution do you think you can achieve with your maps and would that differ for onshore and offshore uh, monitoring? Thank you. 
thanks for the question. So the um, spatial resolution drops with distance for us as well. So if I, if, if I have a, um, a deeper target, then my spatial resolution will be quite low. So if we're really talking about a deep storage application, I think what we're thinking about at the moment, sorry, from the surface, I think what we're thinking about at the moment is really you'd have a, probably an average mass of the, of the site rather than having a detailed map or so. If we start talking about something like boreholes, then you could be getting to resolutions of something like 20 centimeters along the borehole, depending on how fast you want to survey or how many measurement points you want to take or how long you want your survey to be. So if you can get close to the thing, then you can get very high resolution. But if you're really far away, it, it's harder. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got a couple of, uh, well, a question and a comment from Damien Wood online um, from the Circular Economy Consultancy. So the question is, have you approached marine seismic companies and or gravity survey companies around this technology? Um, and the comment uh, that this could also complement uh, toward electromagnetic surveys. So a question around um, being approached by marine seismic companies. Yes, so thank you for the question. Um, I'm, we're, we're engaged with several marine survey companies. I'm not, sorry, I'm not completely sure if those are involved in... Um, in seismics or not, but we're working with uh, and linked companies like Bridgeport where they're doing gravity surveys um, commercially in the maritime environment. So they're a, they're a collaborator in the hub and they work with some of our partners to think about how they can put, bring gravity sensors into marine applications. So we definitely see an interest from that kind of sector. And of course, what those people want to see is um, usually end users don't actually care if it's quantum. What they want to see is that there's a big benefit. And so what, what we're really trying to do at the moment is actually make that step to demonstrating quantum can benefit in those applications. Because as you see, the kind of demonstrations we've done so far are um, quite controlled environments. So it's a road that we've surveyed over, but it's not a ship. And we're now in the hub. The main focus is how can we go from that kind of semi-static sensor to something that can operate on a ship or moving platform. So that's the kind of the trajectory in that direction. And on um, linking to electrical sensing, yes. So I think we really have to be careful not to present that um, gravity sensing with quantum is going to replace other technologies. It's not really about that. It's about bringing in as a complementary technique and offering a new data stream that's not currently very available. So gravity is usually one of the top choices in, in the applications we look at when um, people want to look deep. But the problem is the sensors just cost a lot of time to use and take a lot of time to perform a survey, and that's hindering their uptake at the moment. It is the message we get from, um, from end users. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so just one last question from John, and then we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, uh, John Gibbons. UK CCSRC and University of Sheffield. So I'm looking at capture applications and I want to know what's going on inside a, a packed column between say one and 15 meters diameter uh, and you've got liquid trickling down over packing and you want to know the distribution of that liquid. Uh, could you do that with gravity? Uh, it's hard for me to give an immediate answer. I think it's the kind of thing we could model and, and give a better impression of. If we can get some if there's a substantial variation in density, then in principle, yes. If the density contrast is not very large, it's very difficult. So if, if you're wanting really special resolution, you need to be close. Yeah, I mean, it's variable, varying rapidly over time, but you're interested in the average, the average density. And yes, I think, I think the, you know, there's a, a fraction of a millimeter of stainless steel or a fraction of a millimeter of stainless steel plus a millimeter or two of liquid. So mm -hmm. it ought to be different. Okay, yeah, so if, the, if there were changes to density in principle, it's possible, but depends how yeah. much and so on, of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, Thanks thank very much. To thank Michael. That was a really great presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next up, we have our, our first of two speakers from the University of Sheffield. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Kevin Hughes, who's a senior lecturer in the Energy 2050 group in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Sheffield. So, Kevin, the floor's yours. Well, good morning. So I'm going to talk about some work that was uh, funded by flexible funding from the UK CCRC last year and into this year. And with that, we employed uh, our research fellow, Christopher Parks, to look at some amine atmospheric chemistry uh, aspects. How do I move? Sorry. 
So Chris's background was very much quantum chemistry. So he focused on molecular modeling calculations using the Gaussian 09 software package. And for those of you that are unfamiliar with that, it allows the calculation from first principles of the energetics and structural properties of whatever molecule or species that you're looking at. There are a variety of methods that you can use within that. I'm not going to go into detail about them. In Suffice to say that they're consistent with what's used currently in the literature, and they, in general, represent a compromise between accuracy and computational cost. For the work that Christopher typically did, you'd be looking at a few hours in the simplest case, maybe days or even weeks in the most complex cases. Um, in, as well as the Gaussian 09 calculations, he started some preliminary work with the ADMS software package. So that's an atmospheric dispersion model package, and it has a relatively simplified amine chemistry component within it. So he did a little work, a bit of work looking at that as well. This slide is just describing or illustrating the molecules that Christopher concentrated on. Obviously, MEA being the base case, as it's the most relevant one that's of interest, the most data that is, exists in the literature. For the purposes of his modelling methodology, he also looked at some relatively simple amines that uh, computationally were not that expensive to investigate, just so he could validate and test his methodology. And then he moved on to more complex amines that may or may not be of interest in the future, either individually or, or mixed. And for the purposes of the use within the ADMS package, there are, this just illustrates the class of reaction that you need to know about for the individual amines. So there's the initial radical formation by hydrogen abstraction from some point in the amine molecule, either by OH or potentially other species as well. Then once you have that radical produced, you have the reaction with oxygen, uh, the imine formation steps, and also, in addition, the reaction with nitrous oxides, giving you either nitramines or nitrosamines. This is just to illustrate some of the output from the Gaussian package that, that Christopher uh, generated. So what we have here is a potential energy surface for the reaction of AMP with OH, so on the y-axis, we have the Gibbs free energy uh, of formation of each species. Uh, it's all relative to the initial reactants, AMP and OH, being set to be zero. Uh, and we see the progress of the reaction through a variety of... Th there are a variety of options as to where the OH can abstract the hydrogen from. So we have the, I think you can see the four different transition states that represent the four different routes illustrated in this figure across the products. The most important aspect is the properties of the transition states. Their relative energies, they dictate which are the preferred routes for the reaction. And out of the Gaussian calculations for each transition state, you, you can then calculate or estimate the reaction rate coefficients for the reaction via that particular route. So this table is just summarising the, the uh, activation barriers in the Gibbs free energy barriers for each class of abstraction reaction forming each type of amine radical and then from just a straightforward transition state theory type of calculation that data then can give you an estimate for the rate coefficient for that particular reaction. This is, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into detail about this, but again, this is the activation barriers for, for each type of reaction, but on, on, a, on a wider variety of amines that, that Christopher in investigated. So this is just for the record. It's not, I'm not going to go into any detail on, on it in particular. 
He also did a lot of work extending this to any amine he could find or think of almost. Uh, he, ne he never completed this, but uh, he got a, a long way to doing it in terms of certainly the, the OH radical abstractions. So if any of these turn out to be potentially of use in the future, then a start has been made on, on, the, on the collection of the data for them. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, ADMS is the atmospheric dispersion modeling software. Uh, it, it's quite a complicated program. Ob obviously, you have to worry about the boundary layer in the atmosphere, the background uh, N NOx levels, the background ozone levels, the background OH level, temperature, light flux. So there's a, there's a lot to it. Also, it will use a meteorological data file, so you've got wind speeds and, and directions that influence what happens. But in terms of the amine chemistry, this is it. So reaction one represents the abstraction by OH from the amine molecule. Uh, two routes, either from the nitrogen itself or from another point in, in the molecule. Reaction two is then the reaction of that radical with oxygen to, to produce your imine. Uh, reaction three is the reaction with NO to the, the nitrosamine. Uh, NO2 is reaction four to the nitrobene, and also there's a branching route to an imine. And then there's a photolysis route as well. And to actually use ADMS, you need to supply values for these rate coefficients one to four, certainly. Uh, I think the ADMS itself will take care of, of reaction five from, the con from whatever uh, boundary conditions you put in into it. And then the question is, well, where do you get these numbers from? They, they exist in the literature to some extent, certainly for MEA, uh, less so for other amines. And then do you believe the numbers? Uh, how sensitive is it, is it to, the, to these numbers? So in terms of the actual ADMS modelling that, that Christopher did, he, he didn't progress it too far. Uh, he just looked at the uh, example models that are supplied within the software itself and, and did a sort of sensitivity analysis type study with them. So it's an example sim simulation, I think a 45 metre high stack. The, the areas of typo, it's actually 55 by 5,500 metres when, when I looked into it in more detail. And it uses a meteorological data file with uh, data at hourly intervals over a day. And what he did was systematically vary various parameters in the same mean model. So in this table here, we have the column for K1 highlighted. So the green one in the middle is the base case. And then the top row is a factor of 10 higher. Um, and so on, and the bottom row is a factor of 10 lower. And what I'm going to show on the next slide is just the outputs for the base case in the middle, the factor of 10 higher, and the factor of 10 lower. And, and the first one isn't particularly illuminating because not a great deal happens. So this is just varying the amine abstraction reaction. So middle row, base case, top row, factor of 10 higher, bottom row, factor of 10 lower. And for this particular configuration of the model, on inspection of this, you wouldn't observe any meaningful difference. Whether that's the case in all situations, it's impossible to say, because it'll be very dependent on the specifics of the model itself and the conditions. So we then did the same thing, varying the rate coefficient for reaction two, uh, and again, the same principle, just the factor of 10 higher on the top row, the base case, and the factor of 10 lower on the, on the bottom row. And in this case, we can see that, that there is an impact on the nitrosamine concentration when you do vary that particular rate constant, certainly increasing it. And then the final one I'm going to show is just K3, the same principle. And again, in this case, uh, It's, it's similar to the K1 in the, the, that it, didn't, it wasn't actually sensitive to it in this particular example. 
but it is just illustrating that you can run this model and you can see the influence of varying the various parameters in it. But the real question is to have a meaningful model in the first place and that, that, that's of, of relevance or interest to you. So I'm just going to summarize what he actually did. He did a lot of uh, DFT studies in Gaussian, uh, certainly on the seven amines, uh, also extended it to a, a lot of different amines, and he did some initial simulations using ADMS. He was of the opinion that there was always scope to improve the quantum chemistry calculations. Uh, I suspect, though, at great computational cost would be the downside to that. And from the output of Gaussian, you can extract rate coefficient values for the reactions of interest, and you can use them within ADMS to customize the ADMS model. Uh, he did a lot of different amines, as I said, that could, so you could extend it. The biggest one, from my point of view, that would need, would need, or still needs to be done, is is validation and optimization of it. I think in in the real world, you'd be very hard pressed to get meaningful data that you could use to test this model. So those emissions of amines, that they're, they're quite low in the first instance, and and the degradation products will be extremely low concentration. So it's, a, it's questionable how well you can measure them. And then because it's the atmospheric dispersion, you've got all these competing influences of wind, sunlight, temperature, that, that make the actual interpretation of your data in terms of the actual chemistry itself extremely difficult. So ideally, uh, we would like some lab-based controlled experimental studies. On, on, on a previous project where we looked at liquid phase amine degradation and oxidation, there, there do exist in that situation controlled laboratory studies where they uh, look at a function of time of the evolution of the amine and the growth and degradation of intermediates and products. And we developed a methodology where we took our kinetic mechanism and used a genetic algorithm optimization approach to A, see how well the, the kinetic mechanism in the first instance agreed to that data, and then using the genetic algorithm optimization just to test whether that mechanism could be optimized to match the experimental data. And ideally, that type of approach or something similar would be needed in this atmospheric chemistry uh, aspect. If you did it in the lab, you could do it at much higher concentrations than are actually present in the atmosphere. So you could make things easier to actually measure as a function of time. And, and then if you, if you could then run your simple mechanism and optimize it, then at, although it's not at the actual atmospheric conditions, at least then you have a bit more confidence in the numbers that you're plugging into those individual reactions when you come to run it in the real world uh, atmospheric dispersion model situation. So at that, I'll finish. And just at the bottom there, so Chris managed to get three papers published on the quantum chemistry aspects of the work that he did, uh, for those of you that are interested in it. So I'll stop there and answer any questions if I can. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the floor? There's no online questions at the moment. Uh, oh. Thank you very much. Owen Tucker from Shell. Um, yesterday we had a presentation from the Health and Safety, ex not, not Health and Safety Executive, Environment Agency. And obviously they were discussing their BAT creation process. So how is this sort of feeding into elements like levels of safe emissions and how, how, li how linked up is this research into that area at the moment? Well, I know, I know they're interested in it. I mean, we, we've had some discussions over the last year with them about this ADMS model. Uh, I, I don't know in the nitty gritty of exactly how it's linked into it, but, but people are worried about the emission of these amines, and in particular, some of the nitrosamine products potentially quite hazardous to health. So they, they want to know what's emitted, and they want to know what, where does it go. Uh, 
but exactly how they would link this type of information into what they're working on, I, 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 I'm not in a position to, to give you a definitive answer to that. Thank you. Yeah, that would that would have been my question too, is how that links to, mm -hmm. to what we heard about yesterday as well. Any more questions from from the floor? Up there. Yeah. Uh, Cl <coughs> Clint McKenzie from ACOM. I just wanted to pick up on Owen's question and uh, the validation point. Are you? looking at a project to try and validate some of this data, particularly for the second and third order degradation products it gets? So, so we, we had this, as I said, we had this flexible funding from UK CCSRC, and we had a bit of funding from other sources. So we had uh, Chris working on this last year, so and, and earlier this year. That, that's come to an end, so we need, we're at the stage where it's sort of we're in mid-air. We, we need to get uh, a, a bigger project funded. <laughs> And, if, and if, if I was going to be writing a project, I would be focusing on the validation side of it because it's all very well to run these Gaussian calculations and get these numbers out, but, but without something to put a handle on how, actual, how closely they match reality. I mean, we don't really know how reasonable that simplified five-step aiming mechanism is in the first place. So if we have some real data, then we could test the validity of that simplification to begin with, and assuming it was a sufficiently reasonable sim simplification, then we could test the validity of the numbers that we get out of it. And, and if the numbers that we get out of it don't agree with the validation data, then we could try and optimise it. So even though we might not have uh, something directly out of Gaussian, we would have something optimised to actual real data. That, that's the biggest uh, challenge immediately that I can see in, in this area. Thanks. Okay, last quick question from John. Still have a question. Thanks. Uh, Kevin, do you think there's any chance of getting any validation data out of full-scale plants and the plumes, or do you think the concentrations are just too low? I, I would worry about the concentrations, uh, I, mean, I mean, the ADMS output, is you're looking at micrograms per cubic metre, and, and I, I'm not enough of an analytical expert to know at what level you can actually measure reliably from your atmospheric samples. And, and again, you've got all these competing in influences of what's the wind speed, what's the wind direction, what's the actual OH background in the atmosphere, what's, what are the NO and ozone levels, because they all impact on the final outcome. So you could measure something, but then how you then back out the detail of the influence of the amine chemistry itself when there are all these other variables impacting on it. So to, to, to get the amine chemistry, you really need controlled, known conditions in the first place. Okay, so are there any more questions or should we move? Uh, okay, so we'll move to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Kevin. <laughs> so um, a swap around from the, um, uh, the, the listed agenda. So we've next up, we've got um, David Can from the University of Hull, uh, where David is a teaching fellow within the engineering department um, and he's been doing research on cryogenic carbon capture. Thank you. So, yeah, so uh, I'm going to be talking about a UK CCS fund or flexible funding project that I was working on in collaboration with the University of Edinburgh. It was on using electrical capacitance tomography to measure the buildup of CO2 frost within a cryogenic packed bed. So, I'm just going to be going over just a little bit about a little bit of my background of research in cryogenic carbon capture, trying to give a little background to it, and really talking about why ECT, uh, ECT image reconstruction would be beneficial to what I was trying to do. Talk a little bit about uh, our setup, our methodology for setting up our experiments, 
some of the lessons we've learned from uh, setting, from doing that. The results, discussing about CO2 frost results and water results, and some conclusions and ideas for future work. So cryogenic carbon capture is a method of carbon capture that removes CO2 from a flue gas through temperature change. So a physical phase change where reducing the temperature of the flue gas sufficiently will either, uh, will either desublime CO2 out of the gas as a frost or will liquefy CO2 out of the gas as or under a higher pressure. So typically my experiments are related to cryogenic packed beds. So we, fee we cool down a cold bed material feed through a simulated flue gas of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and CO2 will desublime and form as a frost on the packed bed. We've done some uh, review work uh, comparing cryogenic capture technologies with other available technologies in literature, and generally uh, cryogenic carbon capture is relatively comparable in terms of energy duties with the other most common uh, technologies available. It generally just comes down to specific niches of applications of which applications or technologies are most suitable towards a specific or towards a specific application. So cryogenic carbon capture does very well for flue gases which have a high concentration of CO2. The more dilute the CO2 is in the flue gas, the colder you have to get the flue gas in order to desublime CO2 as a frost, so you have to put in more energy duty for diluter streams. But see, cryogenic carbon capture can operate at atmospheric pressure, so you can reduce the energy, the energy requirement for compression issues. And you know, CO2, the CO2 frost that we form on the packed bed is very useful because that is a demonstration that we are capturing CO2 and separating it out of the flue gas. However, that buildup of CO2 does eventually reduce heat transfer efficiency. So it has a, an insulating effect on the packed bed material as CO2 frost develops. And as it starts to insulate, as the packed bed becomes saturated with CO2 frost, you will get, a, a, you will get excessive accumulation of CO2 frost within the packed bed. So I have up here a diagram of my cryogenic capture rig. Uh, in order to have an idea, in order to basically be able to operate these cryogenic packed beds efficiently, it is important to understand how CO2 frost is developing within the packed bed. We know that as CO2, or as the packed bed becomes saturated with CO2 frost, there's going to be an advancement or a development of CO2 frost through the packed column. So over time, the frost front will advance until the packed bed is fully saturated with CO2 frost, at which point we would need to st uh, periodically stop the process, regenerate CO2 so that we can recover it and capture it, and then you either store or utilize further, in, further on. The CO2 that we are able to capture through this process is a very high purity because the CO2 uh, will undergo phase change and desublime at a relatively much warmer temperature than any other gas present in the flue gas, with the exception of water. So you need a preliminary water drying stage in a more robust system. So, for, so within these cryogenic packed beds, it's important to understand how the CO2 frost is developing. The way that this is typically done and the way that I was previously doing this was using thermocouples. So we could just take temperature measurements at specific points above the gas injector where we're feeding the flue gas in. And as temperature starts to rise within these uh, temperature profiles, we know that CO2, or there's heat transfer going on, so CO2 is starting to desublime as a frost. As the temperature starts to plateau, that CO2 frost front has now fully developed at that stage within the bed. So being able to measure the time and knowing the distance from the gas injector where these thermocouples are placed, we can get a rough idea of how, of how fast the frost front is 
advancing through the Pax column. So on the left, I've got uh, two uh, correlations of the frost front velocity for two different bed materials. So yellow is the frost front velocity for a steel bed material, with blue being the frost front velocity experimentally found for ceramic bed material. Because ceramic is slightly, the ceramic we were using was slightly less dense than steel, we were finding a, well, the frost front velocity is slightly faster. So higher density, bed higher density bed material is much more beneficial for capturing as much CO2 as possible per centimeter of bed depth. So I'm, under I'm able to understand, or we're able to calculate and or find out the frost front velocity within the packed bed, but you can't really, or well, using thermocouples, it's difficult to get anything more robust than that, which is where the idea of idea of ECT sensors came across. So I had met uh, Yuan Chen a bit before at a uh, ECR away day, where I found about where we sort of discussed our individual projects. And we came across this idea of collaboration, where an ECT sensor can essentially use electrical capacitance to, or well, using, surrounding the packed bed, or yeah, the packed bed column with electrodes. We can use electrical capacitance to measure the overall resistance or relative permittivity of materials within the packed column and start to create a, di a digital image reconstruction of what we are seeing within the packed column. So uh, within the gas or the CO2 frost and our bed material, start to understand regions of high and low relative permittivity and create a sort of digital map of what we're seeing. The Issue with or the issue with ECT is that it needs to measure a relative change in relative permittivity. So the flue gas that we're using has a relative permittivity of one. The CO2 frost has a relative permittivity of 1.6. So it's a very relatively quite a low relative permittivity. And so we had to work out a methodology of how we were going to best be able to get as much of a relative change as possible so that we have as great a fidelity of image reconstruction as possible. This is where we had the idea that you know, a ceramic bed material that we, or we had found a ceramic bed material with a relative permittivity of about 30. And because of the CO2 frost insulating effect, as the CO2 start, would start to develop a frost on the bed material, the relative permittivity of that ceramic will start to drop quite significantly from 30 down to 1.6, which is a much greater relative change than what we would see just from the flue gas straight to CO2 frost. So our baseline assumption for setting up our experiments was that a high relative permittivity bed material was going to provide very good uh, ECT measurements and e good image reconstructions. That is going to, I'm going to call back on that in a bit, so keep that in mind. And on the right, we were performing some, uh, or just working on some simulation work. So the areas of blue within these phantom models are like fresh ceramic bed material, with gray being either a void space or CO2 frosted bed material. And the image, re the reconstructed images show the red areas where we find uh, ceramic bed material and the blue areas where CO2 frost is forming. So the sort of phantoms that we were generating were being reconstructed, reconstructed very well by the ECT sensor. So we were fairly confident that we were going to be able to get some good image reconstruction data. So moving forward, we, atta we attached the ECT sensor to the cryogenic packed bed and started to and started to work on our experiments. So we would feed through a cold nitrogen gas through the blue line, which is pre-cooled through a liquid nitrogen bath, and that cools the bed material down sufficiently. And once the bed material is cold, we switch over to the red gas line, a mixed gas of nitrogen and CO2. It's pre-cooled very slightly within the liquid nitrogen bath, where the packed bed will do the last bit of cooling in order to desublime CO2 frost. 
the thermocouples are metal, so we cannot directly measure temperature within the region of the packed bed where the ECT sensor is found, as they sort of create a grounding effect or misplace the travel, the traveling of the electricity and mess with the results. So we have to use thermocouples instead to measure above and below the ECT sensor and interpolate an idea of the temperature results. If you look at the uh, image that I have shown, the photograph that I've shown of the rig, the copper plates at the bottom of that capture column is the ECT sensor. In order to have a good fit for the ECT sensor with the packed column, we removed a little bit of insulation, <coughs> and that had an effect on the, has a slight effect on the temperature profiles. So this red line is the temperature profile below the ECT sensor. You know, we still have a very, we still have what we would usually expect to find. So a high, well, there's a rise in temperature as heat transfer is occurring. There is a significant plateau so that we know CO2 frost is forming at that stage of the bed. But due to a slight insufficient, slight inefficiencies within the cooling step due to that lack of insulation, we didn't unfortunately always see a perfect plateau forming above the ECT sensor. So there might be slightly less frost present within the packed column as what we would be used to from previous experiments, but we were still fairly confident that the ECT sensor would be able to detect some form of change. The ECT sensor did not agree at all. <coughs> the relative change was between half a percent to two percent, so it was not really detecting this sort of relative change that we were expecting from 30 down to 1.6. Really what was happening was that the ECT sensor was trying to detect that, that relative change from 1 to 1.6 from the gas to the CO2 frost and it was essentially being drowned out by how large the relative permittivity of our selected bed material was. We weren't getting that total insulation effect that we were hoping for, and so it sort of came to, we sort of started to realize that our baseline assumption that we would have that total coverage of CO2 frost on the bed material insulating it wasn't, <coughs> wasn't uh, particularly correct. Which would mean that, you know, uh, what, what we expect, so that's most likely going to be that CO2 is not forming fully, it's just getting like small patchy bits and pieces around the bed material, or that there's point, points of contact between individual beads of bed material, so that you don't get a total perfect coverage. This means that, uh, if we're going to take this into future, it's actually the complete opposite of what we had predicted, so a very low relative permittivity, which isn't drowning out the relative change that we were hoping to look for, would actually be best. Yeah. So uh, before sort of just giving up straight away, we did also do, well, alongside CO2 frost experiments, we did also do water frost experiments. So water has a relative permittivity of 80, and when it freezes into ice, it drops down to, to about three. So that's a very large relative permittivity change, which isn't going to be drowned out by the ceramic bed material. So we were doing water frost experiments as well, as we were fairly confident that with our general experimental setup, this should work. So we were performing water frost experiments just to check that you know, the application of ECT technology to the packed bed was was able to find, was able to produce any sort of result, or whether the experiment was fundamentally flawed somewhere. Uh, from our ECT profiles, we were able to detect just about enough of a relative change that we could have a point of high calibration and low calibration, which allowed us to create digital image reconstruction. So these are different methods through either two-end calibration using the high and low calibration, or using single point calibration with different sort of uh, algorithm or optimization algorithms to be able to get an image reconstruction of what's happening within the packed column. So we can generally see that overall, a optimized single end calibration method created the clearest and most representative idea. So we're not getting these sort of 
uh, presence of artifacts around the sort of walls of the column which are occurring due to some poor interaction between neighbouring electrodes of the ECT sensor. And that generally, overall, we can see that the, uh, or at least from the centre of the column out towards the wall, the flow of gas and therefore the phase change from water to ice is relatively uniform across the whole bit of the column. So there's no, there's no instance of gas channeling or there being greater levels or significantly greater levels of gas flow specifically through the core of the uh, capture column. So there's no velocity gradient of the gas. So in conclusion, we had, you know, we had sort of worked together and you know, just did some investigative experimental work and simulation work on being able to test whether an ECT tomography sensor could measure the buildup of frost within a packed column. Uh, although we weren't able to you know, fully get some good results at this early stage, we were fairly confident that you know, uh, taking, on the, taking on board the lessons that we had learned and moving, for, moving forward, we could probably simulate, CO or simulate that CO2 formation well in future work by changing our bed material or changing some slight things about our experimental methodology. And that's, you know, there are some modifications that we could make, could make to be able to better validate that, such as using a transparent piece of pipe where we could actually look in and visually see frost formation as we're not able to use temperature profiles to directly measure and compare our ECT sensor results with. So that's everything that I had wanted to talk about. Thank you. And are there any questions? Oh, sorry. Great. Thank you, David. Um, so we've got a question online from Ben Stewart again. Um, and he asked, during the research, did any of the carbon frost exhibit great stability? Uh, carbon frost, it depends on the... So it depends on the experiment. So because of there was a slight lack of insulation in these experiments, carbon frost was probably less stable than what I would find in some of my previous experiments. But generally, you can get a good amount of CO2 frost forming for a good few minutes per experiment from this experimental setup. And then once CO2 frost is formed, it can actually be quite difficult to set up another experiment because you have to sort of wait for so long for the CO2 frost to actually defrost and sort of do a another run. So, you know, it's fairly, the CO2 frost is fairly stable for a good couple of hours with the insulation around the packed column at this, or for this uh, demonstration rig. Thank you. Are there any questions from the audience that's here? So in terms of the, I mean, obviously it's a, a, a fairly novel approach. How, do you have a feel for how far it off it is before it could be used in a, a kind of more of a real world or commercial setting? Mm, I think it's still, you know, I think we'd need to do our, or if we need to do like future work, like experimental work. So I think it's, the first step is going to be like getting that actual demonstration that we can detect CO2 frost before trying to take it before trying to scale it up and go commercial. Because I think when you try to work, you know, it's perhaps just a little bit more difficult to build an ECT sensor for larger diameter packed columns. So I think it's still got some way to go yet. And presumably one of the, the advantages is the environmental performance of the capture process if you're moving away from an amine-based system, is that right? There is that uh, benefit of that. There isn't a physical solvent process or no chemical reaction. It is just that the phys it is just a physical phase change from a ga gaseous phase to a solid state. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, any more questions from from the audience here? Hi, uh, Ryan Habella for Aqua Carbon Capture. Uh, just a quick question. Do you get some interest from industry for with regard to flow, flow insurance in pipeline and, uh, from transporting natural gas, maybe having some um, ice formation and, and um, yeah. Um, and any, what, what would they do with, with regard to conventional technology measurements and uh, is, does it compare or can it be, can it be s of some advantage? I'm not too sure. So the 
technology is be or technology in terms of natural gas like there is some interest in using cryogenic carbon capture for biogas upgrading because again the difference in desublimation temperatures between CO2 and natural gas is quite signif is significant enough that you can ca uh, essentially purify your biogas by freezing out the CO2 in a tech or so there are some there is exper there is interest in industries for cryogenic carbon capture in terms of how uh, these processes for like liquefied natural gas or other cryogenic techniques would deal with co2 would deal with the formation of frost i don't I'm sorry, i don't know how they would compare off the top of my head but as i said from experimental like the experimental work for cryogenic co2 capture and the build up of co2 frost is generally or is generally been done through temperature measurements and thermocouples. So this is the, or this ECT sensor has the, been the mo most novel approach of being able to understand frost formation within a column or within a pipe, if that answers the question. No, I, I guess my question wasn't clear enough. Uh, so not considering the capture side, yeah. but um, the instrumentation part and, and the measurement of uh, ice formation in a pipe, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, transporting gas and, and gas flow insurance. Um, if you have like hydrate formation, basically, for example, which is just uh, meth methane ice yeah. uh, or CO2 ice formation for CO2 transport, for example. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that y your, your methodology for uh, monitoring ice formation, my question is how does it compare to what's being done today? It could it be of application? But that's the question. I think it's going to depend on it will depend on like the size of the pipe. But yeah, I think you know if you are looking, I think if you're looking for the formation of I, if you're looking for the formation of ice within pipes as you're transporting CO two or transporting natural gas, you know it it's something that you could certainly be looked into using electrical capacitance tomography. So it may should be comparable to what or if it. Once it's once it's developed enough, it should be comparable to what's being done already. It well, it'll just be have to wait and see, I suppose. <coughs> okay, great. Thank you, David. It's really good okay. talk. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so our final speaker this morning, before we can go to um, coffee break, is Stavros Mihailos from. He's a research associate. At the uh, University of Sheffield again, working in the Translational Energy Research Centre and in the Energy 2050 group. Um, so thank you, Stavros. Thanks, Claire. Uh, so hi, everyone. It's Stavros from uh, Sheffield University. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, some uh, recent uh, modelling activities uh, in Derg regarding CO2 capture in a multi carbonate fuel cell for uh, sustainable aviation production. Yeah, so basically, today's presentation uh, uh, comprises uh, theoretical design and energy systems modeling, and uh, in particular, uh, we have the, mol the MCFC technology that uh, utilizes uh, flue gas that comes from. <coughs> biomass uh, grade boiler already installed in uh, Turk, uh, PEM electrolyzer uh, for uh, hydrogen uh, production, and then the sustainable aviation fuel is produced, uh, uh, let's say, through a two-stage uh, conversion uh, system. First is the hydrogenation of uh, CO2 in a reverse water gas shift, followed by the fissure drops, and uh, finally the fractionation of the different uh, hydrocarbon cuts. It's a multi-scale modeling uh, study. So we have uh, employed a console for multi-physics at Aspen for uh, process modeling. And uh, we have managed this way to establish the fundamental mass and energy balances. An overview about the some brief advantages of the MCFCs that can treat uh, flue gases from uh, different sources, so basically different partial pressures of CO2. Uh, it can produce some additional power while uh, capturing uh, the CO2. It's a bit uh, flexible, so apart from in terms of uh, fuel consumption, 
apart from hydrogen, can use also methane, but uh, reform is required uh, a process that can incur uh, internally into the anode uh, channel. Uh, the basic chemistry, so uh, in the cathode we have the flue gas uh, where the CO2 and oxygen uh, yes, react to give uh, the carbonate which uh, migrates uh, to the anode where it's uh, converted to CO2 and uh, water after reacting with the hydrogen fuel. Uh, this is some of the basic input data that uh, has been retrieved by TERC facilities. So the size of the MCFC is uh, 30 kilowatts uh, that uh, requires 166 uh, cubic meters of uh, uh, flue gas. Uh, the system was modeled so as to achieve 90% uh, uh, CO2 capture, which translates to 18 uh, cubic meters per hour of uh, CO2. In our design, we utilize the hydrogen. We have uh, readily available hydrogen uh, on site. The electrolyzer can produce up to 107 cubic meter per hour, which is uh, more than enough for the fuel cell. Uh, the efficiency of the electrolyzer is 80% and it's powered by green electricity and uh, basically an assembly of uh, PV and uh, batteries. Uh, now, the multi-physics model, so we have uh, developed a 2D model. Okay, you can see here uh, all the components, uh, the two channels, the electrodes, the electrolyte, and uh, next to that, uh, the created uh, mess for which uh, we have uh, solved the conservation equation of uh, mass, momentum, uh, energy, and charge. And uh, we have... Uh, validated this uh, model currently with other models, but uh, we plan to do that once we get experimental data with our own data further validate our uh, approach. Uh, so far, uh, we have uh, reached a good agreement with uh, existing uh, literature. Uh, here are the gradients of uh, temperature and uh, CO2 and hydrogen uh, consideration. We see a uniform uh, distribution of uh, temperature. Uh, it is a cross flow. There is no laser in it. It is a cross flow configuration. So uh, CO2 comes uh, from the top of the cathode, while hydrogen from the bottom of uh, the anode. Uh, we also drew the Polarization curves that actually test uh, the effect of uh, temperature on the performance of the system. Uh, so we can see that at lower temperatures, we have the fuel cell is more efficient. We have uh, better power densities, and we can see ki some kind of a maximum between 3 and uh, 4,000 amperes per uh, square meter. Uh, we didn't see much uh, difference in terms of uh, CO2 capture and uh, in the base design we have uh, utilized the temperature of uh, 600 uh, Celsius and uh, the voltage 0.4 for uh, our flue gas concentration which is uh, around 12%. Uh, uh, now the next step is uh, the conversion of CO2 to final products. I have uh, here some uh, simplified uh, PFDs uh, from uh, Aspen. So the first step is the hydrogenation, the reverse water gas shift uh, reaction. So basically we have tested uh, multiple approaches starting with equilibrium at a very high temperature to reach around 80% after recycling. The hydrogen to CO2 ratio is uh, 4 uh, while heat is provided by off gases that are uh, produced uh, within the process. Uh, in Turk, actually, in the plant that will be commissioned sometime uh, next year, uh, we'll be using a uh, different catalyst uh, that is, uh, has uh, reverse water gas activity at lower temperatures, so you know, we can uh, reduce uh, some of the heat uh, consumption. Uh, you can find more uh, data about the catalyst in the attached paper. Uh, so basically, yeah, it can operate at uh, lower temperatures. So one, uh, we propose something like uh, uh, reactors in series to enhance uh, the conversion. 
we tested some uh, kinetic uh, models, but uh, we based on uh, the literature we were struggling to find uh, models for the side reactions, especially for methane production that can be quite crucial for the next step, the fissure drops, as it can be in theory converted to CO2 through the Sabatier reaction. Um, the also fixed uh, conversion, so basically our plan is to develop our own kinetic models once we get uh, data which uh, are going to be more comprehensive than existing in the literature or so with uh, side reactions and uh, yeah, basically side reactions for methane production. And the next step is the fish uh, troughs. Uh, it converts uh, syn gas to long chain uh, hydrocarbons uh, with some assistance from uh, Fortran due to limitations with us when we use the ASF distribution uh, to predict uh, the carbon distribution. You can see here the molar and the mass. Uh, if you focus on the mass distribution, you can see that uh, we have uh, enhanced uh, yield of middle distillates, which is actually our uh, target. Uh, well, we are uh, working and uh, we will publish sooner than later. I uh, hope uh, in a couple of months uh, we'll keep the UKCC uh, as uh, updated. Uh, publication where we have a more uh, advanced uh, kinetic model, okay, that uh, actually we use cobalt-based catalysts that uh, give rise to even higher light hydrocarbons methane and uh, other uh, light alkanes or alkenes and uh, some olefins as well, okay, which uh, we plan to saturate. Uh, but uh, yes, this data will be published, I hope, in the next uh, couple of months. Uh, the final step is a uh, conventional uh, distillation uh, unit uh, with uh, all the different uh, hydrocarbon cuts. You can see our assumption about the classification of the hydrocarbons, the carbon distribution across uh, uh, mm, the system. So 42% goes to jet fuel. Uh, still, we lose around 22% in uh, uh, as uh, flue gases. Uh, something yeah, I forgot to mention also in the previous uh, about the recycling of off gases. Uh, some they are sent uh, to the engine, some they are going back to uh, fish atrops. We are um, communication with our industrial partners, so basically how much flue gases we need as inert gases, uh, what's the, uh, in the fish atrops, so basically for uh, thermal stability. Uh, in the literature, the reaches a bit wide from 20 to 50 percent of the inert uh, of the gas header the fissure drops should be inert gases. This is something that uh, actually we're trying to optimize uh, in collaboration with uh, the technology providers. Uh, yeah, this is uh, schematic and overall schematic of the fundamental mass balances, which you see how much electricity we need to run the electrolyzer, the oxygen uh, produced as byproduct, uh, the hydrogen required to run the MCFC. Uh, this electricity should be 30 kilowatts, sorry. I'm going to update it when uh, I send it to Caris. Yes. Uh, and uh, basically, we need uh, roughly 4, uh, 4.2, 4.3. Uh, kilos of CO2 to produce one kilo of uh, hydrocarbons, valuable hydrocarbons. Um, now we have done, uh, started recently doing some isolating basic DMCFC and studying some uh, heat integration and uh, hydrogen recovery studies. Well, uh, basically at this point we have isolated the MCFC uh, unit and uh, uh, studied uh, basically the energy penalty. Uh, the energy input to the system is uh, the hydrogen, but in our case, the electricity to run it. In our simulations, we have uh, 
18 cubic meters per hour, but uh, realistically we have been advised that we need around 20%, most probably. The energy penalties uh, within this rates, well, I mean, someone should uh, clarify that uh, compared to other technologies, uh, we need electricity instead of, I don't know, maybe low-grade heat or uh, for conventional I mean, systems, for example. Um, again, we ran uh, recently many heat integration studies, okay. Uh, in a recent review by ICOM, uh, they proposed that uh, there might be opportunities for uh, steam uh, generation. Another uh, uh, configuration that we look at is how to recover the hydrogen, the excess uh, hydrogen from the system. Uh, so we've been looking on uh, conventional units at the moment, like a water gas shift followed by membranes, PSA, uh, and yeah, but uh, we, yes, as I mentioned, there was the generation to have the energy efficiency of the system. So as a summary, we have developed and validated uh, 2D model for the MCFC. We have established uh, the fundamental mass and energy balances for uh, the low carbon uh, shaft production. Uh, based on the modeling, uh, the MCFC appears to be efficient capture technology with energy penalties comparable to traditional systems, but again, we need to separate a bit between first law, second law here, uh, thermodynamics. Uh, as I told you, we, uh, sooner than later, we will uh, present some of the kinetic model work that uh, we have been done for the fischer tropper And uh, long-term uh, heat integration for the different components of the assembly and uh, energy recovery. So that was uh, me. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Stavros. Uh, are any questions from in the room? John. Yeah, Stavros, you probably guessed I'll ask this. The, the energy consumption. Yes. Sorry, was that the energy for the separation of the CO2? The four point something. Ah, uh, the energy to the electrolyzer to produce that. I mean, the basic energy input is the fuel in the fuel cell. Hydrogen or methane, but because our uh, hydrogen is electrolytic, it's basically <coughs> the energy to the electricity to produce the electrolytic hydrogen. Okay, all right, thanks. Yes. Thank you. Another question in the back. Thanks. Um, my name is Marspec Harriet Watt. I, I, I can just very quickly do the translation for you. So, f four to five gigajoules uh, electricity is equivalent to um, uh, to twenty gigajoules thermal. So yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so depending on yes, yes, uh, true, true. Uh, yeah, not the second one. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I may, I'd like to ask the same question as I've asked the others. How how far away towards commercial deployment, do you think? This uh, there are the pilot plants uh, in the US. It's uh, hard to say because there is also the competition with uh, the other more mature uh, technologies. Uh, so far it's been used also for stationary purposes for electricity production, basically, but uh, as a CO2 capture technology, there's still a long way, I believe, to its commercialization at, at, the, at the large scale, at least. Yeah. And, and uh, in terms of the sustainable aviation fuel, how what's the performance like compared to more conventional fuels in terms of the carbon emissions from that? Uh, yes, uh, um, yeah, true. Uh, we do also LCA and uh, we produce, uh, we'll uh, give you some uh, outputs. Uh, we saw reduction more than 50%, which is basically the current mandate from uh, the government even up to 70% uh, for uh, this kind of uh, technology, CO2 to aviation fuel, yeah. 
Is that across the full life cycle? Yeah, 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 so full uh, supply chain uh, upstream uh, emissions as well for uh, renewables, uh, all uh, <coughs> the full supply Great. chain.